My name's Ben Raskin. I'm uh, a head of horticulture and uh, agroforestry at the Soil Association. Uh, I also uh, manage an agroforestry planting uh, near Swindon, uh, Helen Browning's farm, as well as having set up a failed agroforestry uh, the horticultural system about 10 years ago, uh, which we can talk about at some point, but, uh, and all through the wood chip handbook. So if, if sort of I keep dropping wood chip into the conversation, you'll know why, so I apologise in advance. Uh, so the point of today's session really, Jez and I initially started this as a way of bringing together foresters and farmers to explore the potential for more profitable trees on farms. Um, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Clive Thomas as well for stepping in um, to support Jez. Just lost his voice a couple of days ago and we weren't sure if he was actually going to be able to uh, participate um, and he's still a little bit uh, sort of his voice is still not 100% so um, if I can just ask Clive to introduce himself because he's going to help out and take some of the pressure off um, Jez's voice uh, and he's got Clive's got a long track record in forestry he's my key ally in our other forestry work at the Soil Association. So Clive, would you just introduce yourself briefly? Thanks, Ben. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So yeah, Clive Thomas, I work as a policy advisor for the Soil Association for the last five years. Uh, during that time, I've been focusing primarily on developing our thinking on regenerative forestry and also our farmer-led tree revolution uh, thinking, um, which very much agroforestry and farm woodlands fit into that. Um, as Ben said, I'm a forester by training, had a 30 year career in forestry in the UK and overseas, uh, and I'm speaking to you from West Wales today. So nice to be with you all. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Clive. Uh, so if I just sort of explain the format of the session today, it's going to be, broadly speaking, it's going to be a conversation between Clive, Jez uh, and myself um, with I hope lots of contributions uh, in the form of comments and questions from you. Uh, we're going to start off just with a couple of brief introductions from myself um, and Jez, and then we're going to split the session into three blocks of discussion of uh, around 20 minutes or so. Uh, so those are going to be uh, around the subjects of future climate and resilience, uh, the balance between ecology, farm and profit, and then looking at type and size of plantings. So within those three headings, this is when we're really um, hoping you'll, you'll throw lots of questions at us and, and comments. Um, it won't work without that. Um, so do do that. And, and obviously do introduce yourself in the chat and uh, share where you're from and, and what you're up to and any experience or questions that you have. We're, we're sort of aiming roughly to take an hour and 15 minutes for the whole thing but uh, so that that gives us time uh, if we do end up with lots of questions to overrun but um, we might well uh, finish just ahead of the final schedule. So that's that's the plan. <clears throat> so to to set it up I think most people would now agree that more trees on farms is a good thing for the climate uh, and increasingly, I think the benefits of farming systems are being recognised and understood. However, the reality for many farmers is still that trees are not seen as financially beneficial to a farm business. For, for decades, I think hedges and farm woodlands have been seen as at best neutral and at worst uh, a problem that costs money to deal with. Um, hedges have to be flailed, trees in the fields get in the way of the plough and you know they fall down and we have to go and clear them up. Um, so they're, they're sort of a problem almost rather than an asset. You, you know you see them in a way they become, become a casualty I think along with a lot of other things of this drive towards efficiency and specialisation uh, which obviously brings some benefits but, but we lose stuff. Um, and in the past you know, I think most farmers would have seen their trees as another useful output from the land. But now, you know, there's no, there's no value in a hedge or a woodland if you can buy your fruit from the supermarket or you can erect cheap stock fencing or heat your house with oil. So, you know, timber production has, has been left largely to the commercial forestry sector. But as we see in many things, outsourcing uh, is a risky business. 
Um, and, you know, the last couple of years, we've seen empty shelves, we've seen huge increases in timber prices and fuel. Uh, these, I think, are probably a sign of things to come as climate change destabilizes our way of life. Um, trees are, by their very nature, a stabilizing force um, and, you know, can bring resilience into your farm system and business. But today, a lot of farmers will have had no experience of harvesting woody products, um, you know, unlike probably their grandparents and almost certainly their great grandparents. So how do we rebuild those traditional skills of processing, for instance, while incorporating new technologies and opportunities? Uh, you know, wood chippers have only been around for what, 140 years. So we're only recently beginning to really explore the whole range of opportunities that arise from that particular product. Um, you know, we're looking at plastic replacements, you know, there's, there's opportunities for woody fibres there. So there's lots of stuff that we could use uh, modern knowledge to complement that traditional expertise and techniques. But as well as how to manage and exploit the trees, farmers also need to understand the impact that trees will have on their farming systems. And this, you know, this is where the power of agroforestry comes in, I guess. You know, rewilding might have a place in some circumstances, but I certainly don't want to replace our productive farming land entirely with woods and forests. Forests. So, you know, how can trees enhance a farm's health, resilience, productivity? How do farmers know what trees to plant and where on their farm? It's, you know, it's complicated business. There's endless choices to be made. Um, and it's one that's not made any easier by our changing climate. Trees that, uh, you know, that would have once been a mainstay of new plantings, you know, ash, obviously, you know, they're now off the table. And others that even 10 years ago might have been inconceivable and now a serious option. Uh, at Eastbrook, for instance, uh, where I'm managing the agroforestry, we planted 60 almond trees um, and they're growing really well in North Wiltshire, which is not an area historically famous for almond cultivation. I haven't had much of a crop off them yet, but they're growing well and looking healthy. So just as a vegetable box scheme or, uh, or farmer's market can bring community jobs, fresh seasonal produce to an area, so building a small scale woodland economy, woody economy, could complement commercial forestry operations and, and offer a different way uh, of looking at the tree economy. So in this, in this session, we want to explore some of those opportunities and challenges around making money from trees. How do you measure the success of a crop that, that might produce an income or replace an input cost that, that also benefits your other farm enterprises? Planting a few native trees in an unproductive corner of a field might provide some shelter or browse for livestock, but unlikely uh, is unlikely to be highly profitable. But, but equally investing in the trees, knowledge, harvesting, processing equipment for, say, a large nut enterprise is a big step to take with, with high risk and long payback times. So navigating all of this for farmers and really sort of judging what's going to be best for their farm uh is tricky um so on that note i'm going to hand over to jez and he's going to sort of give a few thoughts from from his perspective hi thanks ben um morning everyone ben could you whilst i'm speaking just keep an eye on the waiting room and admit yes. people yeah, thinks do that. we yeah. don't appear to have a facilitator or volunteer Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Apologies in advance. Um, nasty young children have managed to give me some sort of laryngitis. And um, I've been able to spend Christmas not talking to anyone, which has been a blessed relief. But uh, we'll see how it goes today. So uh, my name's Jez Ralph. Um, I am from a forestry background but most of what I do now is sort of at the interface of um, different timber uses, I guess. So about a third of the time we spend in the forest and within land use, about a third of the time 
we spend with timber processors and non-timber forest product producers doing product development work and about a third of the time we spend with end users especially architects and developers looking at timber use and developing um i suppose specializing in circular economy and good enhanced local uses for tree products and by that i don't mean sort of very localized niche scale products but what we're interested in is how we can get a true economy from localized um, supply chains that have scale and real value to the whole of society and we do a lot of work within that within agroforestry and within land use and farming as well and so i suppose the first thing to say to start the morning with is that to sort of you know historically farmland came out of the forest you know originally if we look back at the first human settlements in the uk then actually what we're seeing is people carving agriculture out of a forest and pasture setting and it's funny that now agriculture has become obviously a completely dominant land use but actually we're sort of starting to revert back to a situation where land use becomes mixed and perhaps you know hopefully in the future more equilibrium in land uses and the way we use the landscape we sit within and we're at a crossroads in this evolving land use pattern where um you know it's starting in some parts of the country to get more difficult to differentiate the forest from agriculture or trees from any other crop and i'm pretty sure you are all from a very wide variety of areas of the uk um we've recently been doing some work in cumbria and whilst i'm based in devon where agroforestry i think is becoming a pretty accepted practice uh when we suggested we run sessions on agroforestry in cumbria the client looked at us like we were completely crazy people you know some sort of hippie from totness wanting to push some kind of weird land use on farmers yet down here i think it's becoming much more accepted and so there's quite a disparity across the country of how agroforestry and trees within agricultural systems is being seen um and i suppose before we get into the meat of the section you know the main thing i want to say is that there is no magic money tree um you know people seem to have an attitude that you stick trees in the ground and you leave them to just grow actually you know the care you take with your tree selection your tree growing should be and has to be as considered as any other crop or management system on your land you know picking the right hybrids picking the right place to plant trees picking the right species is difficult and exciting as much so as any other crop and of course I suppose we should be um thinking about this as a type of silviculture and silviculture is not a word we commonly use but if you are planting trees or have trees on your farm then the silviculture should be as common a word in your vocabulary as agriculture and it should be as considered as agriculture is and so um without further ado i suppose we should get on to the first part of um i guess the meat of the session and the idea is we're going to give a very brief introduction to three areas future climate balance between ecology farm and profit and type and size of planting but what we want to do is see this as a conversation and a q and a session so this session entirely relies on um you providing us with questions in the chat box and we'll see how it goes um but the first area of course is uh, future climate and resilience 
and um, how you plant trees and manage trees within that context because of course it's easy enough to change your agricultural crop on an annual or two or three or five year basis and it's not so easy to change your tree crop and one of the things that um, I find fascinating and daunting and um, really exciting about forestry is that when you make a decision to plant today actually we're making decision on the needs of our great great grandchildren almost and the future climate is likely to be different then than it is now and how do you roll that into your decision making about um, trees on farmland and it's inevitably a compromise you know, if you're expecting to hear a right and wrong answer, you ain't going to get it because, quite frankly, there's plenty of tools available to model future climates and what species will grow. But there isn't that much consensus, really. And I suppose um, if you're planting for no particular focus or if you're just after putting trees in the ground, for the subsidy you'll get then actually pretty much everything will grow pick a local provenance pick whatever you want you know it's likely to grow um it might not grow well but it will grow if though you have a focus whether that be timber or nitrogen fixation or shelter belts or whatever it is then suddenly actually this future climate is incredibly important because you need to um, start to focus your planting decisions based on it and you need to start to look at where the origin of the trees are where the provenance is of the seedlings you need to know what the hybrids are that you're going to plant and you need to look at what the likelihood of them producing your objectives is in the future so it's no good for instance just saying ah uh, we're just going to stick local provenance oak in because actually that local provenance oak, that local seedlings, they will grow. But if what you're after is timber, will does that local provenance produce good timber now and will it in the future? Are you best looking at, say, mid-French origin crops? And of course, the same thing occurs if you're thinking of diverse species mixtures which we'll look at in a bit you know in terms of future climate don't be swayed by this sort of rather bizarre outmoded idea of nativeness um you know what is native now is not what is native in 200 years time potentially and we need to be aware of that now when we're putting the trees in the ground and actually what it comes down to is this idea of diversity as a key to resilience and that's diversity in species and diversity in structure um, and diversity in economic outcomes from the trees you're planting. And so, you know, this type of planting matrix might include hedgerows and it might include woodland and it might include sulfo arable or pastoral systems. It might include a whole diversity of species, but getting diversity will almost certainly make your planting resilient to future climates and disease and also resilient to future markets as well. And so it might be that you take a hit on profitability by having four or five potential product or services within your tree planting but you also make that resilient in a way that though you may have smaller volumes you are at least resilient to future marketplaces and future climates and i think i'm going to leave it there before my voice actually does go thanks jess that's great so we've we have already got some questions coming in, which is which is really good. Uh, and perhaps start with a sort of a broad one, which is from Ian Davis, which is far too much of current legislation 
policy advice and business regarding tree is around commercial forestry for timber harvest. How do we change the policy and advice culture? And I guess sort of with particularly with that climate change, uh, you know, adaptation lens. So five or, or <laughs> have you got any thoughts around right there? And how would you, that's a big question, isn't it? Well, uh, yes, I think it's a perception question, actually. Um, to, to give an analogy, uh, my brother is a journalist and he believes that media as a whole is far too uh, focused to the right, whereas I think the media is far too focused to the left. As a, and as a centrist, and yet we're both centrists. Um, I, the way I see it is that legislation and policy and government is way, way too focused on non-commercial planting and act at a huge loss to actually productive planting. And actually, the centrist approach is there shouldn't be a difference. You know, your productive planting should be ecologically and climate resilient and your non-commercial planting should actually have a commercial focus and objective as well because there's no reason why you can't grow prop crops and products and services from a, a planting that has a primarily ecological objective. Can I just build on um, what Jess has just said there, Ben, um, and maybe sort of analyse it from a, a different angle as well, which is uh, I certainly agree with what Jez has said in with regard to um, I guess this kind of artificial distinction between commercial and other objectives. I think one of the you know one of the great things about trees, whether they're integrated into farming systems or whether they're as a standalone woodland or forest, is that they can deliver multiple benefits. Um, you know that's long acknowledged. Obviously, you've got to do it in the right way in an appropriate way. Um, but that's one of the uh, fascinating things about this tool that we're talking about today called trees. But what I would, would agree with the question from Ian about is that uh, I think government policy, uh, perhaps until the last few months, has been very focused on a particular way of woodland being created in the UK, which is much more of a tenure-led change model of woodland creation. Uh, and I think the idea of farmers being in the driving seat of what we really need in this in this country, which is a, a farmer led tree revolution. Um, and the topic that we're talking about today, which is how trees can not only provide all those public benefits that politicians are eager to be delivered, um, but how they can also benefit farm profitability in the farm enterprise as well. Uh, and again, that is a potential win win in that they can do both at the same time. Uh, but as I say, I think a lot of the um, the kind of mentality um, within the incentives that have, been, that have traditionally been there uh, and some of the regulatory uh, requirements as well, uh, and this perhaps lack of focus on whole farm planning using trees as one of the tools to, to deliver an integrated whole farm plan. Um, that's that's really what needs to change, I think, in terms of the policy and regulatory environment. Um, so I'd agree with Jez, it is a perception issue, uh, but there is definitely a perception issue within government as well about viewing it in that way uh, and viewing it that um, I guess the managers of 70% of the uh, landscape here in the UK, which is the farmed landscape, have got a much bigger role to play by being in the driving seat on this than perhaps hitherto imagined through, you know, more of a, a tenure-led change approach to um, land use change. And I guess in a way that's, you know, that's where, for me, that's where the, the potential of agroforestry comes in, because it does bring it all together and it makes people think holistically. And, you know, it means that we've got the three of us talking together from a farming and forestry perspective that wouldn't happen, that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, and it's and it's how do we expand that and and but you know try and make everyone think like that I guess is is uh, is the challenge isn't it? Yeah, I think institutionally as well, there's been some hard wiring over the last hundred years that has meant that there's been an artificial divide between agriculture and forestry, 
Um, so again, there does need to be progress on breaking that down. Um, so I think, as, as Jez said in his opening piece, you know, farmers begin to think much more like foresters, but also foresters begin to think a lot more like farmers as well. Uh, and there needs to be um, that integration kind of professionally and institutionally, uh, as well as the regulatory incentives. Yeah, and, and it has to be, I mean, I was going to say there has to be a better relationship between policymakers and tree growers, but actually, it, is that even possible? I mean, the civil service and government is so wholly incapable of looking beyond a sort of five or 10 or 20 year time frame that you almost want, that's of no use to forestry at all, yeah, especially at the moment. When we make a decision about planting today that has a sort of 80 or 100 year effect, uh, how, how does policy even cope with that? So let, and uh, and do, do we even just give up on that ever being a thing? So I think that's quite a nice sort of link into this question of, you know, what is native and, and planting for climate change. So there's a few questions that have come in. There's one from Matt. Livingston, who's actually interested in, in a list of non-native trees that people are choosing. So he's planted almond, persimmon, black locust. Um, there's a comment from uh, Anna Lee, who says that they're guided by what stock they can plant in the ANOB. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, it's not always a question of just sort of making the decision yourself. Um, and certainly, you know, Woodland Trust, some of their funding is dependent on, on planting native trees. So, so I'd be really interested from a forestry point of view, you know, what are the recommended trees from a, you know, if, if I'm wanting to plant a commercial tree crop on my farm, as well as getting those other benefits, what are the ones that are being recommended? What are, I think you mentioned, Jez, the tools that are available to help estimate tree growth in different climates, you know, what are, what are some of the opportunities? You know, is there something we definitely should not be planting anymore because it won't it won't work in a warmer climate? Um, okay, so I first, I suppose, to start answering that sort of my personal viewpoint is that I don't think that the word native is particularly relevant within the context of changing climate. You know, if what grows locally will grow well in the future and meet your objectives and ecological objectives, great. If it doesn't, fine, pick something else. Um, we live in a diverse cultural society and actually our forests and trees should be as diverse and cultural I'm as well. Has someone got the volume? Oh, that's better. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to go in particular species because there's literally thousands of potential species, but the Forestry Commission has modelling tools to help you model what uh, future climates might look like and what species will work well. If you look up ESC, ESC and climate modelling tools on forest research, you will be able to get to them and you'll be able to do site by site searches. There's a website called Silver Future that um, looks at potential future species. Um, and th th those will both link you onto other websites that look at what potential species will grow well in your area. Um, what, what I'm definitely not saying is that we should ditch native species. What I'm saying is that if a tree regenerates and grows naturally in the UK. It's pretty much, as far as I'm concerned, nativized to some extent. And it's yeah, that we should grow the best tree for the best for that site, irrespective of where it might have come from originally. Um, and the decision is based on future climate on site conditions, on soil health, and on um, outcomes and outputs you want that tree to fulfill, not on where it comes from. 
Hi, have you got any? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, and, and another way of um, thinking about this and, and kind of quite a practical way of thinking about it as well is to, and, and you do have to caveat it a little bit, uh, given uh, what's happened with ash uh, over the last five years, but you can get a lot of um, clues to what will grow well on your land by looking around your land. You may even already have trees on your land. Uh, your neighbours will have trees. There'll be some knowledge in the locality um, uh, just based on observations or uh, conversations uh, about which of the species, either introduced species uh, or native species are performing well based on the land capability, the climate that you're uh, that, that you have uh, in your local context. Uh, and I think just kind of building on that as well, another way of um, thinking about this is also to, you know, how you might actually, actually introduce more trees into your farm, into your farming system. And it doesn't always have to be by planting them. Uh, it's perfectly possible if you already have uh, a seed source, either by letting your hedgerows grow out, uh, or you may have some small farm woodlands, uh, where you've got the opportunity to move the fence and, and expand the woodland um, uh, and, and think about how you're actually managing your farm to encourage the natural processes that um, obviously if the land is heavily modified that might not be possible for them to, to, to get going again uh, but in many situations and in, in this, this kind of quite good evidence that some of the increased woodland cover in the UK that's now being sort of monitored uh, is actually being driven by natural processes as much as it is to do with artificial planting. I, I think I'd just counter that a little bit by saying that's not how you'd look at an agricultural crop. You know, if you were planting wheat, you wouldn't say, oh, well, let's take that native grass that's almost like wheat and it'll just sort of spread into the field and we'll harvest it and we'll get something a bit like wheat. You'd carefully look at what hybrids are going to suit this site. You're going to look at the genetics of it. You're going to take a very considered view of what you plant. And actually, if your local seed source fulfills everything you need it to fulfill in your treescape, then fine. But if what you're after is, let's say, quality oak in your woodland and the local seed source genetically gives wibbly wobbly oak, don't use that local seed source. You know, find better genetic seed source for that. And also, you know, it's all very well saying, look around the landscape of what grows well now. And if you're planting something like hazel that has a fairly short lifespan then yes use local seed source but actually if what you're expecting is a hundred year rotation then what grows well in the landscape now isn't necessarily what grows well in the landscape in a hundred years time and you are making that decision on behalf of your you know great 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 grandchildren now it, it just requires silver culture it requires thoughtful decision making before yeah and serious decision making as serious as any other crop or land use yeah of course but uh, I, I was making my point in the context of your earlier point jess which is about setting your objectives yeah uh, so yeah i was just introducing yeah. one yeah. one way of achieving those objectives but of course yeah. objectives are varied mm. and you'll have to tailor tailor your response accordingly of course yeah so, so if we're not going for natural regeneration, there's a couple of questions around where we actually get the trees from. So Ruth Curtis asks, where will or should all the trees come from that we need to plant? And then from someone who looks like he might want to supply those trees, uh, Sam Kenyon is saying, I want to turn part of my farm into a tree nursery for broadleaf trees, but I've been advised against it due to the heavy handed forest reproductive material roads. Do you have advice uh, or see the rates changing for small scale growers and you know we ran an event in Wales recently and there were something like nine farmers looking to set up small scale tree nurseries on their farms so, you know there's obviously a need for more trees there seems to be an appetite for it are the regulations difficult is it is it a feasible uh, operation as a as a as a you know a, um, enterprise on the farm it, 
there is a major, major source shortage of tree nursery and potential future planting stock. I mean, we do not have a hope of fulfilling the government's tree planting targets with the amount of available nursery stock. And so there is a desperate need. Um, and actually, this, there's another question in the chat about timber and small scale sawmilling. And I think it's almost the same question, actually. It's um, how can you make small scale nurseries or sawmills work within an economy that has been very focused in the last 70 or 80 years on industrialization and centralization? And it's something that we're very interested in. Um, yeah, you know, how, how can it's sort of you need to have a compromise between having a, enough scale to make those regulations work for you or make them less burdensome per pound of cost you're putting into the operation, but not going on huge centralized industrial scales. Um, for me, it's about capturing digital technologies to create efficiencies in what you do. So is it possible to have small scale sawmilling on the farm? Yes. If you are, can develop or if someone develops digitally adapted small scale sawmills, is it possible to do with a small wood miser? Yeah, if you don't have any aspirations to grow bigger. Um, yeah, and the same I think is true with tree nurseries. If you can use digital technologies to reduce your costs, then it's entirely possible to do, for sure. Um, but it requires that sort of distributed manufacturing, I think does require harnessing the digital revolution to do it well. Clive, we've talked quite a lot about this. I know it's something you're really passionate about is sort of redeveloping that small scale farm woodland economy. And, you know, there's a, there was another comment around collaborative ownership as well, I think, Ian Davis. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I was I saw that. I mean, I know, I'm conscious that I think we're going to be talking about scale a little bit later on in this conversation, aren't we? So, which is why I didn't come in on that point. But um, yeah, I mean, I think building on what Jez has said and picking up on some of those um, uh, those questions in the chat, um, this whole issue of scale uh, and models, whether they're whether it's kind of the digital innovation um, route that Jez is advocating, uh, or whether it's some more sort of traditional approaches to cooperatives, machine rings, um, you know, sharing and pooling resources to try and get over this this hurdle of you know when you're below a certain scale at a farm level. How do you get some of those economies of scale, maybe across the landscape or working with neighbours or working maybe even in a more formal cooperative? Uh, there are there are examples from other um, components of forestry, for instance. So there's a lot of experience of um, e even at smaller scales, um, smaller scales of states of, of pooling marketing to access markets in terms of forest certification, for instance using group schemes for that sort of idea. Um, uh, and also some other smaller scale examples of um, local cooperatives and, and supply chains developing across the landscape uh, or across a region um, to, to try and pick up on some of these scale issues. So I think that's, that's kind of part of the culture that we've lost in this country. Uh, I think you'll find that culture much more prevalent uh, on the continent and other parts of, of the world. Um, but there's definitely an opportunity there and you know, whether that's a nursery opportunity or whether that's the, the wider opportunity in terms of processing and harvesting the, the woody products from the trees. Um, yeah. And we've got a starting point on all this. It's not like we have to wait for some of this resource to grow. Um, maybe the point that we should have made earlier on in this conversation is that there's already a significant resource on farms, um, farm woodland. Ben, I think you... You mentioned earlier that it's you know typically viewed neutrally at best or maybe as a problem um but you know we have got a starting point in terms of thinking about how some of the um scale issues may be surmounted in terms of an already a potentially productive resource uh, as well as obviously hopefully growing more resource in the future i mean it's worth bearing in mind that the the 
globally the biggest wood manufacturer in the world, Metza, or whatever they're calling themselves these days, started out as a dozen small woodland owners in Finland that couldn't create the scale they individually needed to sell their timber to the local sawmill because they all had just a few you know, logs each. But by combining cooperatively, they started by selling into the sawmilling supply chain and then they started vertically integrating. And I think there's a huge amount to be said for vertical integration as a way of getting over this idea of scale or distributed manufacturing. And once they'd started vertically integrating, they just grew and grew and grew. And the start was just 12 small owners. So we have sort of, as we, it was probably inevitable, we sort of strayed a little bit away from the climate and, and almost into some of these later discussions. I think now is probably quite a good time to move to section two of our, of our uh, plan schedule, which is this balance between ecology, farm <laughs> and profit. Um, <clears throat> and there have well, been some questions and, and comments in the chat around, certainly when we were talking around the native things and about considering wildlife. So, you know, the, for me, this is in a way, it's sort of bringing it back a little bit to the farm and thinking about what those trees are bringing to the farming. So there's, there's the productivity benefits and you know, most evidence suggests that, um, you know, you might get say 30, 30% 30 or more increase in productivity when you, when you introduce agroforestry onto a farm, it might increase meat production or, or milk yields, for instance, because of the shade and shelter and browse benefits to the animals. You might extend your growing season by a couple of weeks. You might reduce fertilizer, pesticide bills. Um, you, you might get better infiltration uh, through your soil, which might bring a, a field into crop production, for instance. So that's something we're looking at at Eastbrook, where uh, a field that's quite heavy clay and typically is, is it's been grazed but is flat and, and fertile so it could be suitable for production if we could get in and cultivate it in the spring and your your farm system and business should become more resilient um, with trees not least because you know as we've been looking at you, you should be able to get some marketable tree crops if you can manage them well but understanding that profitability of agroforestry systems is really difficult um, but it, you know, it's quite important probably as well if you're trying to business plan and understand whether it's financially worthwhile planting trees. Um, you get the direct benefit to the farm enterprise. So that might be the shade increasing the milk production. You might have an, an indirect benefit of improved drainage, which sort of gives healthier soil. Or you might get that income from say timber sales or, or wood chip for bedding. And a lot of the farming pioneers in agroforestry are, are taking a fairly, uh, you know, they're taking a gamble. It might be an educated gamble, but it's, it's a still a gamble. We're expecting an overall financial gain in the system, but we don't really have a clear prediction of what that might be for most systems. Um, when, we, <clears throat> when we started out at Eastbrook five years ago, we, we made a 25 year business plan for, for the trees, you know, a 25 year business plan, particularly, you know, we're planting almonds where there's no UK market uh, and we don't know the yield and we don't know the price we're going to get for them in 25 years ago. So it's very speculative, but it, it gives us a, a sense of the return of investment for different trees um, and different crops. And I guess, you know, part of it, and we'll look at that in the, in the final bit around scale and systems is that diversity um, of, of tree and business model. And in terms of the environment, you know, certainly most of the organic farmers I've worked with over the over the decades, you know, would tell you that looking after the environment doesn't have to equal unprofitable farming. And and drawing that line between ecology, farm, profit is is probably futile actually, even if you could do it. But you know, if we're not in the business of rewilding which i think you know most of us aren't then clearly you have to have a balance that allows the farming to continue to improve or, or even increase while still dedicating some land to trees 
Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we could talk about within this, although it's a bit of a rabbit hole sometimes, is the um, is the talk about pest control. Um, and without a significant control of deer and squirrels, you know, a lot of our shiny new plantations are probably doomed to fail. Um, but, you know, how do we do that sensitively without wiping everything out? Um, and while, you know, we've talked a, a bit about natural regeneration, about, you know, I'm certainly really interested in natural forms of protection, the, the thorn is the nursemaid of the oak and, and all of that, you know, how do we how do we use natural protection methods rather than covering everything in plastic? Um, we still, you know, in reality, we still need to up our game in controlling these animals that love eating trees. Uh, so, so those, I guess, are some of the, some of the sort of thoughts around that balance between a profitable farm um, and you know looking at some of the questions are certainly um, questions around you know and it came up a bit around that discussion of, uh, of native versus non-native you know you want highly productive trees you want to make it a commercial enterprise um, but you know eucalyptus doesn't support much wildlife in the UK for instance so that you know clearly there is there is a balance to be had with some of this stuff. So I don't know, Clive and Jez, whether you've got any uh, initial thoughts on that or whether we jump straight into to some of the questions. And you're both on mute. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, let's jump straight into some questions, should we? Should we? Seems to okay. be. Okay, so uh, let's have one for Megan Lee. Is it? important to consider the wildlife specifically birds that rely on your hedging trees planting non-natives could push out specialized species and encourage more generalist species um you know there's there's, there's one about at least the wildlife trust through wilding so there's also this question about payment for public goods you know if income from biodiversity offset for instance becomes part of your business model then yeah you don't need have a highly productive timber tree because you're getting paid for the wildlife so it's, again it's you know it's becoming more complicated probably with these money for public goods isn't it um in the short term yes uh i i kind of quite i i think that in 10 or 20 years time um as the nhs needs more and more and more money and we value social welfare more and more, the amount of land subsidy will go down and down. If you're planting trees based on subsidy, then I think it's pretty short termist response. Personally, I always advise people to set out their objectives, the, the real objectives, irrespective of subsidy. And if you can get subsidy for what you want to do, then great. If you can't, then suck it up. You'll be the winner in the end. Um, yeah, and I suppose on that question about uh, birds um, and biodiversity, yeah, you're right about, I can't remember where it was now. Um, of course, non-natives might provide the same habitats eventually as natives. Eventually, they'll be nativized. You know, we're, we're thinking in a 50, 100 year time frame here, not five or 10 years. Clive. Just to, yeah, just to make a contribution. Um, I mean, we should definitely be setting out our objectives first and then seeing if there's a grant available second. Uh, that, that's clear to me and I think clear to, that would be clear in, in most business senses to, to, to most people. Um, but I, you know, I'd just like to sort of challenge a little bit this idea of it being a zero sum game. I think, you know, point I made earlier about, uh, you know, one of the wonderful things about trees is that they can genuinely deliver the public and the private benefits as well. Um, and, you know, there are a few contributions in the chat that, uh, you know, make that clear um, from individuals' perspectives. I was struck by one much earlier up the chat where um, somebody is using oak that they're growing on their farm uh, as their fence posts. Now, those oak trees, while they're growing, I'm sure they've got fantastic biodiversity benefit, um, but they're also presumably offsetting uh, an, uh, an expenditure that that farmer uh, or that land manager would have in terms of 
buying in fence posts um, and they've probably got a well they have got a much better product anyway by using oak in the first place so you know the, it, it's it, it can be a cliche to say that there are win-wins but they genuinely are um, uh, not every multi you know not every um, option will deliver multi benefits um, but if you really sort of set out with a clear plan with your objectives it, it is possible to, to balance some of these um, different things that we're talking about today, even at a farm level. Um, and I think that, you know, that whole issue of kind of on farm substitution, um, you know, I haven't personally seen any quantification of the amount of money that farmers must spend across the UK on fence posts each year, but it must be quite a sizable sum. Now, even if there was only a sort of uh, initial inroad into on farm substitution for that, that's, that's a net benefit to the bottom line of that farm that's able to do that uh, as long as obviously the costs of what they're doing on farm don't um, outweigh what they would have spent externally. And there's a question I mean it sort of gets a bit practical in some ways but, but also is one of the big questions which is from Richard Watson around the alternatives to using herbicide because you know when you're talking about balancing profit and environment um, you know there's no question that the herbicide is the quickest and cheapest way to control weeds around a tree planting, but equally it does leave the soil bare, it doesn't boost soil health. Uh, you know, my experience with using wood chip mulches is that you get much, much better establishment and quicker growth of trees, um, but it's much more expensive and, it, you know, on huge plantations, is it even practical? Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you a story. <laughs> Being a buff old traditionalist, no field scholar type person that should probably be at the other Oxford farming conference. Um, traditionally, I, I've always advocated the need for good establishment. And if that means herbicides, then so be it to get your timber underway. However, about four or five months ago, we were on a Woodland Trust site where they'd taken the approach to plant on a fairly large scale tall tree tubes and just leave it. And actually what had happened was after pretty um, exciting growth of bracken and brambles that looked like they were going to overwhelm the new planting, they actually didn't. And actually the trees had become pretty well established within the first two years with very little loss and actually no ground prep and no herbicide use at all and you know whilst it was a fairly big planting for a woodland trust site it wasn't on the scale of big Sitka spruce plantings but within forestry we absolutely have a duty to find ways of no till no herbicide planting yeah interesting so have you got any thoughts on uh, on tree establishment or have we I think we've covered that one off yeah, not much more to add really i mean i definitely agree with um you know establishing you know you, you it's a big investment planting those trees um and the last thing you want to be doing is replanting them uh, so you've got to you've got to have a focus on that, um, but we definitely need more innovation. And you know, maybe going back to some of the points that we were talking about earlier in terms of scale. Um, at the moment, it's you know there's, there's um, it's a very manual process using wood chip, um, but you know with some innovation, with a wider uptake, maybe we'll see improvements in terms of the profitability of of, of approaches like that. I've just I'll, I'll copy the link into the chat but as part of um, the agroforestry design workshops I've been doing with farm ed I've, I've pulled together three case studies on uh, farm-based enterprise around wood chip fence posts and uh, walnuts uh, so I'll paste a link a link through to those so you can have a look at them they're not uh, I wouldn't include the figures in your business plan but it just gives an example of sort of how a, a farm-based enterprise might work so there's there's a couple of questions around uh, biomass um, and the opportunities you know for for farmers to have biomass operations. I know 
uh, <coughs> Wakelands, for instance, a lot of their short rotation coppers in their agroforestry system goes to heating on um, buildings and things. So certainly on farm, clearly there's some there's some good opportunities. But what about uh, you know should we be growing agroforestry to feed Drax? He said controversially. No. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> it's boring and it's not a good use of land. <laughs> um, the, the answer is to use less power, not not to feed our current consumption habits. Yeah, we, we can we can do much better with our limited land resource than than growing energy crops for drags. I'd agree with that. Mm. Uh, but as part of a part of a multi benefit system, biomass as one of the outputs from that system. Um, there's definitely potential there, as you say, Ben, on farm. Um, you know, there are again examples of more, more of a local approach to that in terms of feeding a, a, a local demand for wood heat uh, or some sort of biomass. Uh, and that's definitely the area that we should be focusing on and exploring, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, uh... I mean, obviously, these all of these things are interlinked. So, um, you know, we're, we're not, uh, it's always impossible to pick in whole conversations, isn't it? Uh, but if we move on to our final uh, topic of discussion, which is around type and size of planting. And Des is just going to give us a sort of bit of an introduction to this bit of the talk. Excellent, yes. And it avoids us having to answer that question about carbon for the moment whilst we think of an answer to it. <laughs> Uh, so I suppose finally the thing we wanted to cover was um, this whole question of type and size of planting and um, I, I was quite keen to cover this I suppose because from a forestry perspective one of the big objections to one farm planting levelled by foresters is that it's crazily stupid planting two hectares here and three hectares there doesn't really achieve anything to anyone, especially if it's completely fragmented. And what's the point? Um, and, you know, it's very common to hear that within forestry circles. And so the question is, is there a minimum size planting or type of planting? And what should that look like? Um, as I suppose the first thing to say is that size isn't everything uh, and no amount of size. You can have the biggest plantation on the world. If it's on a 40 degree slope, then your objectives have to cope with the slope before they cope with the size of the planting. Yeah, if it's too steep to harvest, no matter how big or small it is, don't bother trying to grow quality timber on it or even firewood. It just won't be workable. Um, and it's about trying to um, match financial gain, if we're talking about the magic money tree, with other expected outcomes and um, minimum viable sizes. You know, I, I'd say in the UK or England, trying to grow quality timber in anything under five or ten hectares is extremely difficult just because of the economies of scale of things like screw control, which are absolutely vital if you're going to grow quality timber. On the other hand, if you're growing biomass, then growing a hectare of eucalyptus might be on a seven year rotation, might be entirely viable financially, but you've got to question whether it's viable ecologically to do it and how that fits in with the whole farm plan. Having said all that, yeah, living in Devon, we're really lucky to be able to get on the ferry when we can, go to France for the day cycling. And actually, you step off the ferry and within a couple of kilometres, you're seeing sub-hectare plots of incredibly well-managed sweet chestnut and oak that are going to be very good timber in the future. And so actually, with thought and care and good silviculture, very small plantings, are entirely possible. Um, on the other hand, it's a monocultural system. So is it something you actually want to go into? 
And I suppose the point that I want to get to is that type and size of planting and how you think about your chart planting, I think is changing absolutely significantly. And it's about thinking of the farm unit and the tree element of it as actually a complex matrix of planting. And so you're not making one decision on, right, we're gonna go into silvo arable or silvo pastoral or eucalyptus biomass or coppice or high forest or whatever it is. It's about having a, a matrix of different planting types within those, whether it's hedgerows connecting sections of small broadleaf woodland, or whether it's saying we're going to rotate eucalyptus through a small coop selection system within a bigger forest so that we um, sort of move around the light conditions, move around the nutrient conditions within that woodland. It's just accepting that woodland, forestry, treescapes are becoming more complicated. And with that complication becomes huge opportunities and um, much more excitement to what you can achieve on the farm. And so, you know, it's not a case of saying, if we want to grow timber, we need over five hectares of good quality mixed woodland. Actually, you can grow good quality timber out of agroforestry systems. You can grow good quality timber from silvo arable systems. We know this because we work with urban forestry, producing very high quality timber all the time. And if you can create high quality timber from street trees, you can create high quality timber from silvo arable, silvo pastoral systems or hedgerow systems as well. And that matrix planting isn't just about how the trees react within the environment and the landscape. It's about the products and services you get from them as well. And by having a complex matrix of planting, you're not just putting all your eggs into one basket of a product, say timber, but actually saying, well, you know, in this coppice system, we're going to get fast growing biomass. In this high forest element, we're going to get some timber. Here, we're going to get non-timber products, or this is for nitrogen fixation. And actually all of those can be occurring on the farm at the same time. Um, but, it requires detailed management planning and business planning and environmental and ecological planning. Um, but you should be doing that anyway within your treescape. The amount of planning within your treescape should be greater than the amount of planning for your other farm, ele farmed elements within your farm unit. Because actually, the long term decision making is so much more important. Um, and then finally, what I'd say is, although it's probably expensive, it's okay to experiment. You don't need to make quick decisions. And actually, if you're what you're doing is planting a matrix of type tree types and treescapes, if one of them doesn't work, it's not like you've converted large parts of the farm to that particular type. You can make a decision and change it. And it's entirely possible to do. And so having this complicated, com more complex matrix gives you more time, gives you more development, and gives you more flexibility to find what systems work best for you on your farm unit. I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Right. Just to come in at that, that point, I mean, I think there's some questions in the chat uh, around um, one component of what Jess was talking about there, which is the, you know, how do you maximise the, the quality and, and the, I guess the financial return from your infield trees, so your trees that are truly integrated into an agroforestry system, uh, rather than your trees that are maybe more in a woodland setting uh, on your farm. And, you know, I think we'd have to concede that there is quite a lot of challenge in that area in terms of doing that um, effectively uh, but some of the principles that we know from forestry around 
you know, that we've talked about already on this call in terms of getting your provenance right, making sure that the trees that you're growing in the first place are going to have the best potential, um, making sure that you're tending them, applying that, those silvicultural principles, probably things like some high pruning uh, in terms of you know, mitigating some of the things that you would get in a woodland setting through the uh, the closed canopy um, help, helping to create some of your timber quality you're going to actually have to apply some of those principles in, in a different way in, in terms of your infield trees um, so there's a lot yeah. more to do on that I think in, in the UK context. I, yeah I actually think it's really easy to grow timber in infield systems because you're doing most of the work anyway you know if you accept you know Traditionally, we say 90% of the value of a tree is in the bottom 10%. So in your infield trees, we're not looking at getting two or three lengths of saw log out. We're looking probably at getting one saw log out of each tree. There might be, say, two or three or four meters in length of good quality, usually broadleaf timber. <coughs> um, in almost all infield systems, you're pruning anyway. You need to get a tractor under it. You need to at least get a person under it. And actually, because they're being pruned anyway, what we find in urban systems where these trees have never been grown for timber, they've just been grown for amenity, the timber quality out of them is properly exceptional just because of this need to prune them anyway. And, yeah, it's... It, don't let people tell you you can't get good quality timber from infield systems because as long as you pick the right genetic stock for your planting it's easily possible to do so that kind of the question uh from mike wilkins about you you know could you give practical examples of silver arable planting and what are the best methods for incorporating beneficial tree planting within arable fields and in a way you know, I feel like you've kind of almost described it there. It's about, you know, it's about basically keeping the trunk clean and, and you know, making sure it grows in a way, isn't it? Because the, mm. the choice of species or, or tree could be anything, you know, it could be an apple tree, it could be a, an oak tree for timber, it could be a willow for biomass, you know, it almost, it almost doesn't matter. Um, as long as you've got the objectives of what you want to do with it in mind. And it integrates with your other arables, with your main arable system. Yeah. As well. I mean, you know, there's no point in growing, say, fruiting varieties where you need good widespread in amongst an arable system that is quite light dependent. But, but actually, you know, if what you're growing is... Um, horticultural crops that are naturally shade tolerant and let's not forget that most of the stuff we grow in open agricultural systems originally came from shade tolerant woodland species actually growing it under shade might not be such a bad thing after all i remember um alan schofield he's retired now he's a grower up in lancashire and he for 30 years he had a uh a, a horticultural agroforestry system with pollarded alder mm. um, and it was it was pollarded on a five-year rotation and he developed this really complicated crop rotation underneath because he really understood you know which vegetables grew well just after pollarding which could cope with the heavier shade in the year just before they were pollarded and even you know which crops did well right up next to the trees and which did well in the middle of the alleys so you know you can get a really complicated system that that benefits from all of those different climates and microclimates within that that sort of changing rotation uh so repeat it yeah it was it was uh, alan schofield in uh up in lancashire he's uh, we're um i'm i'm Starting to work on an idea, an agroforestry horticultural book with um, Andy Dibbon at uh, Abbey Home Farm, and we're hoping to include Alan's system as an example. But yeah, 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 because we, I mean, we shouldn't forget that agroforestry includes growing crops under woodland systems, which is 
are, to me, a huge and underdeveloped area of taking naturally shade tolerant crops and growing them within established woodlands. There's a question uh, from Stuart Jones, which is something that I've been certainly thinking about, which is around the is a data on nitrogen fixation from trees that make a decent contribution to the nutrient budget of your farm. We've interplanted some of the trees at Eastbrook with alder and sea buckthorn, partly because we're hoping that you know the nitrogen benefit will increase. Uh, improved tree establishment and certainly I've read a couple of studies looking at mixed planting where including a nitrogen fixing species within the mix uh, you know speeds up establishment but but I guess you know I think Stuart's asking a slightly wider question in a way is that you know could you then use the the timber presumably as wood chip or something to spread around the farm and, and improve the fertility more widely do we know of data on that? Um, no, I d yeah, I don't see why it shouldn't work. I don't know of any specific data, though. Yeah. Again, it's, you know, it's making that point that Clive was, was talking about earlier, viewing the trees as part of your holistic system, you know, so really integrating mm. the product and the tree into, into your, your whole farm management plan, your, your fertility plan. Right. What uh, we've still got a few questions here. We can. So we. I mean, do we want to try and tackle this carbon? Or there's a nice question from David Newman about how could farmers get together to set up integrated forest enterprises to replace the oil-based economy? <laughs> wow. Sure. Two two big questions. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. Oh. Where to start? Uh, what was the carbon question? Well, so there were a couple. There was one uh, from Ian Davis. The subsidy is going to come from the market, not government in the future, question mark. Biodiversity net gains, carbon payments. And then there was also, uh, well, there was, a, uh, there was a challenge about converting permanent pasture to forestry can release soil carbon, uh, which uh, obviously is not ideal. Uh, and then I think there's another one further up as well. Uh, what impact does tree spacing have on soil carbon accumulation and would it depend on the type of grazing? So there's lots of, sort of lots of carbon questions and I guess it to some extent I think highlights the confusion around carbon and and you know the, our, our current knowledge is that fair to say that we're still kind of learning about this stuff? I mean, I think there's, there's some, you know, there's a reasonable evidence base in terms of, you know, what you might call the payback period. So, uh, you know, any any intervention will have some emissions, um, and there's obviously lots of practice that you can implement to minimise those emissions or, um, as best you can. Um, probably the only way that you would actually truly avoid them would be through natural regeneration. Um, but as, as soon as you're putting a tree in the ground, you're going to be having some sort of intervention and influencing that carbon cycle. Um, so there is evidence uh, around how long it takes for that to be re-sequestered into the, into the woody biomass. Um, I don't, I mean, I think it's like a lot of these things that we're talking about really, once you start managing for one, um, one outcome, one output, be it carbon, be it anything else, um, that's when mistakes start to be made. Uh, either either within an agricultural system or within a forestry system or what we're talking about today in terms of an integrated system so you just got to keep these things in mind I think and um, you know look to op optimize to achieve your objectives uh, and, and apply this apply the best science available yeah uh, totally agree it I think carbon's like covid you can make up the statistics to tell whatever the hell you want um and at the end of the day, it's just got to become a sort of relatively normalised part of society. And it's the same with carbon and tree planting. There'll be some loss through planting. There'll be some gain through the growing of the timber. You know, there's the whole question of, you know, if you really want to sequester carbon, then actually we should be blanketing the landscape in eucalyptus at um, yield class 36 or whatever, but we don't really want to do that. I, there's a very much carbon bandwagon. 
And actually, for me, there's so much more to planting trees than just carbon, that it's an important part of the mix, but needs to be within all the other objectives and benefits of tree planting, I suppose. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think a good, a good sort of philosophy for all this is to remember that carbon is a cycle um, and nothing's fixed. Um, you know, you, you can you can analyze it at a point in time and say where it is, but it, it operates as a cycle. It's it's a natural process. Mm. So let's. Uh, so I, I I think we should we should look at this integrated forest enterprises and how farmers get together. Do we have good examples in the UK of, of farmers working together to you know access local markets or to, to create products? You mentioned um, as that Finnish example, but is you know is there is there stuff happening in the UK that we can be inspired by? Okay. <laughs> I, I've been in this industry 20 years now and must have seen 40 attempts at cooperative marketing and growing of timber and not really seen many that have worked. And um, that there has to be, it's worth carrying on because there has to be a method somehow or there has to come a point where it will work. I'd never know whether it's the mechanics of it or that the time just isn't right um but somehow there must be a way of more cooperative working and this isn't just a uk thing it's sort of it it's not even like you can find huge amounts of examples from the rest of the world i think perhaps the best way of looking at it is um horizontal and vertical business integration um and creating scale through working cooperatively um i i've always got to the point where i feel like i'm not clever enough to answer this question after 20 years <laughs> and actually there's new younger people coming into the industry that are probably much more capable of dealing with it than me which isn't trying to slopey shoulder it but it needs new, innovative, exciting, non-middle-aged thinking. I mean, maybe the way to, to think about it is to turn it back around as well and think about examples, maybe more from an agricultural product perspective as to where cooperative working has had some success in the UK uh, and wonder whether or not that can be applied more to the woody products within farming systems. Yeah. So I know that's a way of, that's kind of another question really, because I don't necessarily have the experience to answer that in terms of the agricultural products. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I would just cite again, the example that I gave earlier around um, the group certification model that does operate quite successfully, even in the UK for marketing of timber into a certified market. Now that's obviously for a very specific objective um, but again, you know, there's maybe a couple of sort of directions to build into from in terms of answering what I'd agree with Jez, that this is a very tough nut to crack. I, yeah, I would say um, within that subject, one of the things that exercises my mind quite a lot is this sort of rural urban contract. And it's something we discuss with architecture students a huge amount is, you know, where do the responsibilities lie between in rural and urban? And one of the things I'm really interested in is how we create scale. So you know, if we look at Devon as an example, to provide ourselves with timber and food in Devon is probably pretty easy. You know, there's lots of land to not that many people and it's easily done, but we have a duty to find a way of creating scale through cooperative working or somehow to provide urban centers as well, because they're now a completely fundamental part of society. And, you know, what we're interested in timber strategies is not selling small amounts of product to small niche buyers. It's about 
how do we use, say, on-farm planting and cooperative working or circular economy or distributed manufacturing to provide to those urban centres as well as ourselves? And as you mentioned, a number of these attempts that had failed in the past, are there, are there sort of key reasons why they fail? Is this, you know, is there, is there a particular challenge that needs to be overcome or is it just that they were all, it was various reasons and there's nothing much to learn? You know, is there, is there anything that comes out of them all <coughs> that needs tackling? Um... Uh an understanding of markets. No. Um, so, okay, to, to be entirely controversial within the kind of people that are here, for instance, you can look at distributed sawmilling and small-scale sawmilling all you like, but it doesn't matter how cooperatively it's done if you're not producing kiln-dried graded timber. But, it's it's never going to work ever and you know whilst the the capitalist economy we work in isn't perfect you know it is the and this cooperative working needs to create markets and products that fit within that and that's not the only problem with it but that's certainly part of it you know if you're going to cooperatively grow walnuts it has to be at a scale that allows substantial manufacturing capability that i think can be done on a smallish scale using digital technologies but it has to have a market for it and you have to know that market before you enter into the cooperative working market is everything yeah interesting Great. Well, thank you. Um, so before I do just a final summing up, I don't know, Clive and Jez, whether you've got uh, any final comments you'd like to, to make or, or thoughts from the discussion. Um, thanks for bearing with my voice, I suppose. But <laughs> for all the potential problems, it's a pretty exciting time for mixing land uses and creating properly symbiotic landscapes where actually we work with the land with the trees with the ecology to create a beneficial landscape for both yeah i mean i was going to end on a similarly optimistic note um uh, well first of all to thank everybody for the engagement in the chat uh, it's been very lively so that's been great. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we are talking about a challenging topic, I think. Uh, and I think we should acknowledge that. But I think we should also acknowledge that the, the prognosis is quite positive, I would say, in that, um, you know, we do know that doing this right works for farmers and works for, um, you know, the wider public benefits that we're interested in. Uh, we also know that from some of the sort of market perspective, um, that there should on paper be a big demand for what could be done on farms. Um, there's obviously a tough nut to crack in the middle in terms of some of the things that we've been talking about here today. Uh, but I think the, the prognosis and the kind of wider policy landscape and also societal landscape um, means that we should carry on talking about this. Great. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. As for managing through your through your voice problems, thank you, Clive, so much for stepping in and, and helping at short notice. Thank you also to uh, to Philippa for helping uh, with the questions and fielding them. Uh, there's there's going to be quite a few more agroforestry sessions at the conference, so do look out for them. I'm involved in a couple of other ones with the um, wood and grazing one and the uh, <clears throat> the one around elms um, and and payments for agroforestry. And I guess, and thank you all, as, as Clive said, thanks so much for your engagement and, and all your questions. There's a couple of um, uh, 
I guess the thoughts that came out to me from it, from around, from today, are, you know, knowing your objective is the key and understanding that and working towards it is really the key and, and looking at the long term with that whether that, you know, what might or might not be native, that whole discussion. Um, and, and yes, take advantage of, of public good payments and, and other subsidies, but not at the expense of your objectives. Um, diversity definitely is, is key. And, you know, I don't think that would be a surprise to, to the audience today. Diversity is always powerful. Uh, collaboration is an opportunity, but a tricky one. Uh, you know, are there new opportunities but for using digital tools as, as have been very successful in local food marketing. Um, you know, definitely seems to me that agroforestry can answer some of those challenges facing tree production and, and developing markets, um, particularly because the drive or the need for profitability from that tree or from that product changes when you look at agroforestry and when you look at the other benefits that having trees will bring to your farm. Um, so those are kind of my my take home messages. Um, I think it is, it is being recorded, so you'll be able to, to look at it or share it later. Um, so thank you all. Finishing on the dot um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>